So we wanted to inform the media, the public and MPs about the government's so-called reforms and to keep our NHS public, which means publicly provided as well as funded. And you hear people saying, politicians, oh, people don't mind who provides a service, but it does matter because the primary duty of a private company is to their shareholders, it is not to the patients. So what's happening in the NHS now is in a real state of confusion because they began to implement this health and social care bill even before it reached the Parliament. And in, uh, they had a, a paper, a, a white paper called um, Equity and Excellence, Liberating the NHS. Uh, and as Margaret Whitehead, who's a professor uh, uh, who's done a lot of work on um, the determinants of health uh, in Liverpool, as she said, um, the only thing that's been liberated is £120 billion for the private sector. <laughs> so th there was a three-month consultation period, which was flawed to start with. Um, they, that ended in October, and then they said to staff, if you take redundancy by the end of November, you will get an enhanced payoff. And they've spent so far £0.9 paying off NHS staff. Other thing is these unprecedented and unsustainable so-called efficiency savings which are being imposed, which have never been done on this scale anywhere in the world. And Sir David Nicholson, the head of the NHS, said um, unguardedly that they were so big that they could be seen from space. When taken up by the Health Select Committee about that, he said he was misquoted, or taken it out of, it was taken out of context. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we have all this thing, nothing is happening to the NHS, and yet everybody knows that all over the country there are service cuts being made as the managers are trying to implement these cuts. Now, where do these cuts come from? In, in 2009, McKinsey's, this American management company, was asked to do a report for the NHS. And that's where we first see this figure of um, the saving of 15 to 20 billion, which is supposed to be ploughed back into the NHS to provide the care that we terrible old people are needing because we are still alive, <laughs> and to uh, deal with the uh, advances in, in care. But we haven't seen any sign of it being ploughed back in. Now this McKinsey report, which they denied they had, when it was sort of leaked to the press, um, they suspended or put on guard leave the person who had been in charge, the head of the commandment, of commissioning, a guy called Mark Ripnell, that some of you may have read in the press about um, six or seven months ago, gave a lecture in the United States talking about how it would be an insurance-based system in, the, in, a, in Britain within a year or two. Now, this report is not what you and I would think of, of something that is rumoured to have cost a five or possibly even six-figure sum. It is a series of PowerPoint slides. If you know narrative to it, their, their conclusion is that you could make these savings and what really strikes me is that technical efficiency savings are between 6 and 9.2 billion from provider costs. That means the hospitals would suddenly save all this money whilst they're doing the work that they've been doing for years. Then this thing, allocative efficiency savings, is 4.7 4 to 6.6 billion. So those aren't quite so wide due to no longer commissioning low-value added healthcare interventions and ensuring compliance with commissioner's standards. So this is the primary care trusts in some parts of the country, like Essex, have stopped 40 procedures being provided to their population, including cataracts, hip and knee replacements, all of which are of proven value, especially to people who are older. Um, 
And then they, the saving of 2.7 to 4.1 from a shift of the management of care away from hospitals towards more cost-effective out-of-hospital um, uh, alternatives. But the thing is, these alternatives are there. But as was shown when they took care out of big mental hospitals <coughs> into the community, um, it may well have been better for, for the people but it certainly wasn't cheaper. It isn't going to save money, I don't think. It is just a guess. It's all speculation as far as I could see. Practically nothing had got um, real evidence for these statements that these management consultants are saying. Now, the other thing the government keep on saying is, we have ring-fenced the uh, funds for the NHS. Now, it was planned for 0.1% increase per year. But John Appleby from the King's Fund, who's a health economist, says that it'll be minus 0.25% because inflation is higher than when they calculated this ratio in the first place. And also, inflation is greater in the NHS than it is in the general population, whether it's measured by RPI or CPI. And then there's this transfer of 2.1 billion over five years to local authorities to provide care for patients coming out of hospitals, which is about 0.4 billion a year, and some observers says it's going to be 0.8 billion a year less for the NHS. And then there's the increased need for the ageing population. So all in all, there isn't going to be an increase in NHS funding. But Cameron keeps on repeating this, and so does Lansley, and so do all these people speaking in Parliament for the Tory or the coalition benches. Now, this health and social care bill is an enormous thing. It's 325 pages long. It's got 220 clauses. Strategically, they've been very clever because they've used all this reassuring language. You know, we're going to put the patients at the centre of care. No decision about me without me, says Getting rid of bureaucrats, reducing that by two thirds, um, and putting clinicians in charge your cuddly GP will be making the decisions about you. Of course he won't be. I mean, they're not trained to do that. Most of them don't want to do it. 70% of them are against this bill. And, but the, the language has been very reassuring. The consultation at right at the beginning was flawed. So they've already decided they're going to do this entire restructuring of the NHS. We're not allowed to give our opinion on that. They had 6,000 responses to this um, consultation. And what they did was they picked sort of one line. So you start off by saying, yes, we think it's good to have patients at the heart of care and, and clinicians more involved in, in decision making, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's pages and pages of all the things that are wrong with it. They don't take any notice of that. <laughs> so uh, I've already said they started implementing the process before the belief reached parliament. And they totally ignored the course of dissent um, from not only doctors and patients, but even managers and think tanks, etc. So the increase in protests, the TUC March, the BMJ, British Medical Journal had an editorial <coughs> entitled Dr. Lansley's Monster. And the Lancet also, another uh, well-respected medical journal, had an antagonistic editorial. Um, we finally got the British Medical Association to have a special representative meeting in March and we voted to withdraw the bill and we voted again in the summer to withdraw the bill because it had been slightly changed. The Royal College of Nursing passed a vote of no confidence in, in April and um, <coughs> the Lib Dems um, in their spring conference did not pass the supportive motion that was put to them by their leaders, um, but they called for amendments, and they called strongly for this, and Nick Clegg did have to go and talk to uh, uh, David Cameron about it. And that's how all these things uh, caused them to have this pause in the middle of the bill and have a second at the future forum at which they then said they had taken um, all their criticisms on board and uh, they had made changes to the bill. The thing is, Lansley announced on the 4th of April that there would be a pause, this pause, and then the Department of Health sent a memo out three days later saying, 
get on with it, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible. And, and then Lansley, after the RCN folks said, I'm sorry if what I'm setting out to do has not communicated itself. <laughs> this is a man with about 40 um, press officers of the Department of Health. And of course, it hasn't committed itself as so communicated itself because what he's setting out to do is to make the NHS into a market but he hasn't told the public that no no he tells us all about conditions in control and the rest of it the future forum came out with a report and they said there was too much emphasis on competition and so they said they would change that and what they did was to change um, the word competition to anti-competitive behavior at one point and the media are so uh, spineless about it. The BBC, I can strangle them. Having had this second bill committee, and they spent two days a week, um, and they were there all day um, discussing the amendments. Labour didn't manage to get one amendment through. Not one. Third reading, the 6th to the 7th of September. And of course, uh, they won by 65 votes, and despite the sterling work of Evan Harris and Shirley Williams, only four Lib Dems voted against it. And so the next day they have the first reading in the Lords. They are just ramming this through um, Parliament. And now we've got the House of Lords, an unelected uh, group of people, um, but we really got to keep the pressure on these people in the House of Lords because they are our last chance to change this bill. You can see that it's a huge fight and this fight must continue. The efficiency savings could be made by abolishing the market, uh, the internal market, um, the purchase provider split. And so NHSCA come up with a new slogan which is heal the split. Um, it would save at least 10 billion a year. If you get rid of the purchase of provider split as they've done in Wales and in Scotland, and their health services haven't fallen apart. You know, the Tories say that the number of managers has increased doubled in the last 10 years. And we think that's to do with the internal market, all these ISTCs and contracting and tendering and all that sort of thing. Healthcare, all the evidence is that it's an unsuitable service for market mechanisms. There isn't any evidence that these changes will save money. And I think that's a good point to put if you've got a Tory MP. Uh, what you need is collaboration, not competition. Now, the thing is that once it goes through the laws, the amended bill will come back to the Commons, and the Commons can either accept it or not, and they can play ping pong, it seems. Um, <coughs> normally, the, the Lords don't like to override the Commons, but as these changes were not in the party manifestos, and they weren't in the coalition agreement, then I think the Lords have got a perfect right uh, not to accept them. Do not want our health care turned into a market, which is what this bill is uh, aiming to do. Um, join or donate to keep our NHS public so we can keep on mobilising people and uh, producing material uh, for people to use. So thank you very much. And different strategic health authorities, um, from what I can gather, appear to have had a different approach. Uh, and in the South West, I think there was a very clear policy approach to deal with the separation of, pro of provision of services um, by going down the route of social enterprise. Other strategic health authorities in other parts of the country have taken a different line. And if you look uh, on the NHS website, you will see that there are a number of, um, of places where community services have been retained within the NHS, within existing trusts, or within new community services trusts. If you look again on the DOH website, you will, see, you will see that a social enterprise is described as a business. Interestingly, the DOH website gives the example of social enterprises such as the Eden Project and J.B. Oliver's 15 restaurant. <laughs> the model that we're following. Uh, again, probably all of you will be aware this in Stroud. Um, a lot of these decisions were made, uh, um, some of them, some of the time in confidential meetings. And 
Um, and so we were uh, in a situation where the proposal was to transfer all of the community services provision in Gloucestershire, not just in Stroud, in Gloucestershire, into a community interest company by the 1st of October 2011, I mean, a couple of, a couple of weeks ago it should have happened. Against the Cuts uh, instructed Lee Day, which is a firm of solicitors in London who specialise in, in some of these public sector actions, to consider whether or not what was happening was lawful. The argument that is being run is that the decision of the Strategic Health Authority and the PCT is unlawful because they've essentially decided to pass a hundred million pounds worth of contracts uh, to novate them, which is a legal term, to pass them over to a company, a community interest company, uh, uh, which is going to run it, and that they have done that without considering any other option and without complying with the public procurement regulations, which next step is for uh, Gloucestershire Health, the PCT, uh, to be given an opportunity to uh, uh, lodge what's called an acknowledgement of service, uh, setting out why or if uh, they think they've got an argument in defence. That case, uh, that acknowledgement of service has got to be uh, back with the court um, by the 19th of November, there'll be then further opportunity for um, uh, for Stroud against the cuts, and in this case Michael, who's uh, the person who's got legal aid to run this case, to lodge further submissions, uh, and then there will be a hearing in front of the judge as to whether or not the decisions of the uh, of the PCT are lawful. What the court can do uh, if we are successful in our case. Uh, is to ask the PCT to reconsider the decision that they have made. What we would be asking the PCT to do is to reconsider how they are going to run community services on the basis that it should remain within the family of the NHS. <coughs> they are perfectly able to consider uh, allocating community services either into an existing trust within the NHS or to set up uh, an alternative community services trust, which is, as I have said, what many other PCTs across the country have already done. Uh, and there is no bar on them doing that. Certainly, if they were minded to, there is no necessity for them to contemplate a tendering exercise uh, into the private sector at this stage, because they would have options within the existing NHS family. And I'm going back to what Wendy said, it's the political will of the decision makers as to whether or not they want these services to remain <coughs> within the NHS structure or whether or not they want to outsource them to uh, a separate legal entity. And in fact, I would argue it's probably more complicated to outsource them to a separate legal entity than to retain them within the NHS. Yeah. Is we cannot leave it to the politicians, Absolutely. and that I think is what we have, we have shown with the campaign here, with Stroud against the cuts and the campaign to defend it. Because what Wendy showed is that actually that all the all of the uh, the, the, the this pro, this present government want to dismantle the NHS, but it led on from what the previous government yeah. were also doing as well. And she said herself through independent treatment centres, through foundation <laughs> trusts, the PFIs, and so on. So we cannot leave it to those people, to the idea that they're going to defend our NHS. It's going to be up to us, I think, to force that issue and to force and put that... We can win in Gloucestershire. That can give hope and can give us a feeling that we can win. Because if you think, really, the choice we're going to be, that, that we face is either fight or watch the NHS disappear. Um, one chance to have our voice heard, and that will be November the 30th. But this all links in with the NHS because the very same people who are being sacrificed by these changes are being sacrificed by the pension changes. I just want to thank Wendy Savage for coming here.